Hello, everyone. My name is Eric K. Thomas. I am the editor in chief of the Quintessential Gentleman, and thank you for tuning in to our Black Men in Tech Representation Matters virtual conversation. Super excited for this conversation. Just want to get some conversations going about Black Men in Tech, talk about how it is to get inside the industry. We're going to talk to some great panelists who are really going to be able to help us um, shape this conversation and just get some insight. So we're going to go ahead and bring in our panelists. First, we have Daryl Butler, who is the Vice President of Devices and Services at Google. Let's see, there we go. Daryl, what's going on? How we doing? How we doing there? Yeah, doing good, doing good. And then we have David C. Williams, who is the assistant vice Pre president at AT and T. David, hey Eric, how's it going, man? Happy Black History Month. Happy Black History. We gonna listen. We gonna hold on to it as long as we can. That's right. <laughs> and then we also have Daniel White, HR business partner, Global Business Solutions at TikTok. Daniel, what's up? Hey, Eric, good to see you as always. As always. How you guys doing? You guys all right? You doing good? Yeah, doing good, man. Doing great. Doing great. Yeah, it's cold weather. Cold weather. Well, you know, all of us aren't, you know, here on the East Coast. So the East Coast people got cold weather. The West Coast, y'all cold is not nowhere compared. <laughs> I'm not going to say a word then. I'll keep you quiet. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. All right, so um, I want to go ahead and let you all introduce yourselves and tell us, you know, your position again. Tell us what you actually do at these companies, so we can dive right in there. So, um, Daryl, let's go ahead and start with you. All right. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be amongst uh, um, Daryl Butler here. I just um, setting the seat here at Google, responsible for devices and services. That's code for creative, campaign development, business development, all the way down to retail for all of our Pixel devices, as well as all of the Nest devices and uh, Fitbit, which was something we just acquired. So I basically look after the marketing um, up to and including all the storytelling that we put in the marketplace to support uh, sell in and sell through. Perfect, perfect. And David. Yeah, David C. Williams. Um, Assistant Vice President of Automation at AT&T. Um, I lead one of the largest robotics process programs in the world um, that's commonly known as BOTS. We automate over 70 million transactions a year, over 3,000% ROI, it's just a huge program. Um, I have an extremely diverse team of, of uh, developers and I'm excited to be here with you guys. Excited to have you, thank you. And Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. So um, I'm Daniel White, and I'm an HR business partner um, at TikTok, where I support the sales organization. And in my role, um, I help develop and execute the people agenda across all HR disciplines and across the employee life cycle. I'm actually new to tech, so I'm, I'm the newbie on the panel as compared to the OGs, David and Daryl. Um, I've been in my role for about a year now. And uh, prior to me coming to TikTok, my entire career has been in financial services um, and HR roles there. So I'm happy to give a very new perspective, but a, a very interesting perspective uh, with my journey uh, in tech. Listen, awesome. We need all of those perspectives, okay? Because we need to make sure that we are represented, one. Here we go. Listen, my, my ear pods, they connect out of nowhere. They just connect in whatever they want to do. No comment. Y'all all know, know my problems. <laughs> um, so just want to kick this off. So today is the last day of Black History Month. And I wanted to just have conversations to just understand, you know, even though we speak so much about representation and ensuring that our um, that we are being represented, we also cannot negate the fact that we are definitely in this space. You know, you have Granville T. Woods, who, you know, his most important invention was the induction of the telegraph, uh, which allowed people to communicate through 
you know, the telegraph wires um, before they were doing Morse code. Then you have Mark Dean, who was a computer special, excuse me, a computer scientist who, you know, was responsible for the color monitor. And then also Gladys West, who was a mathematician um, whose work contributed to the global positioning system, also known as GPS. So we are in here, you know, and I think we, I don't think we know enough that we are in here um, and we want to have those conversations. But I want to know, why do you all feel like it's so important to continue to acknowledge the um, attributes and the contribute um, how people of color have contributed to um, the tech industry? Let's go ahead and start with David. Sure. So, uh, man, look, I feel like uh, you know Scotty Pippen just threw Jordan the alley oop. I uh, when when I started my journey in technology, uh, it was a, a poster that I saw about Granville T. Woods and some of his inventions is what inspired me to move forward. And I felt like it was important for um, someone like myself to try to make some advances, do something of large significance so that other young brown and black faces would have someone that they could connect to. It's hard for a, an adolescent or teenage uh, boy or girl to connect with Martin Luther King or Abraham Lincoln. You know, Martin Luther King doesn't understand TikTok. Abe Lincoln isn't on Google. And so for some of us, who can relate to them and come from the same neighborhoods, if we're able to achieve those things, then it, it helps to make it seem more real for them. So that was something that's very near and dear to me, especially Granville T. Woods' story. Awesome. awesome. And um, Daniel? So when I think about growing in tech and being black in tech, especially in Black History Month, I think about two things. I think about the Sankofa bird. And so the Sankofa bird, for those who don't know, is um, looking back of where you come from in order to progress into the future. And I'm also reminded of lifting as you climb. And so when I made my pivot into tech um, last year, I was reminded that my purpose was to uh, help myself and help myself grow my career, but to also help others to grow their careers as well. Uh, as an HR business partner, um, and just as, as an HR professional in, in the industry and in the field in general, um, I my job is to is to help um, employees to grow into their best selves and to their fullest potential from a career perspective, and especially um, in sh uh, with um, with everything that's going on in the world, uh, it's very important to ensure that more Black and Brown individuals are in tech and, ha and are in the room and have opportunities to continue to grow into their respective roles. And so it's very important that we provide those opportunities to those individuals. Agreed, agreed. And Daryl? Yeah, a different, different perspective from my side. Um, first of all, we can kind of agree that, not even kind of agree, we can agree that people like us shape culture. We shape culture, you know, here stateside, we shape culture global. Um, I think the other thing that we can agree on is that there's a reciprocating re um, relationship that exists between culture and technology. The two really feed off of and grow as a result of one another. TikTok doesn't exist unless there's technology for it to exist on, for example, right? And as, as an arbiter of culture, I felt a, a responsibility to bring that fluency into an environment that doesn't necessarily always have it, right? Technology doesn't necessarily appreciate that relationship that exists between it and how culture moves, right? And being a person in the room affords me the opportunity to help build that fluency and then ultimately get us to a place where what we are creating and what we're putting out into the world actually is a bit of a mirror uh, image of the communities that we serve. So I feel it's a responsibility, not only as a marketer, but just as a as a African American male in culture and and in tech, to actually find ways to bridge build between the two. Oh yeah, well said, well said. So I want to dive right in here. So why is the tech industry? Why does it seem so intimidating? Why why do we have this kind of idea that we are not in this space or that we feel like we have to have these type of conversations, although we know the numbers are what they are. But why does this seem intimidating? Um, David, I'm going to go back to you. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes, um, you know, there are transferable skills that many of us from underserved communities have, right? Um, we make a dollar out of 15 cents. We've all heard that. Um, if a CFO could make a dollar out of 15 cents, that CFO would be CEO. Right. We have that innate transferable skill. We've lived in under our households with our parents, mothers, uncles, grandparents. 
We've learned that, but when we go to work, we leave that in the parking lot. We don't take it in the work with us, right? I believe that if we're courageous enough to take those transferable skills from the parking lot into the corporate office with us, adjust it to the corporate protocol of whatever, wherever you're at, TikTok's culture is different than AT&T. But once you do something like that, you can see the, the exponential uh, value that we all can bring. It's just really kind of breaking that silence to say, look, um, I can do this too. And although maybe my background wasn't uh, traditional, maybe I'm an anomaly and I didn't show up in the demographics that you were looking for, um, I do have this skill and I can do this job, right? I can bring value to this. And I think we just have to have the courage to find those small wins, tell the story of it, market it, as Daryl was saying earlier, and then you know elevate that to if you bring enough millions to Mount Olympus, somebody's gonna listen. Yeah, yeah, so true. And also, you know, definitely showcasing, letting people know that this is happening. These people are in this space. You know, again, I will do our little shout out right there. Oh, you're gonna, Dave, you're gonna talk. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, I agree with you. I think we have to be bold about telling those stories and sharing those stories because uh, we are making huge advances in the world. But if we're shy about and reluctant about sharing that, then a lot of those Granville T. Woods, you know, amazing innovations never see the light of day and they get overshadowed by something else. And also, you know, all of, you know, the panelists are part of our 2022 power list, which was specifically about black men in tech. So we, we, we showcase, you know, about 11 black men who are just killing it in this industry. And these three men right here are definitely um, doing doing what they need to do. And we're showcasing them. And it's, it's, it's important and we have to continue to do it. But Daniel, you know, I'm coming over to you. I need to know why is this so intimidating? I, you know what? I wondered the exact same thing when I was going through my journey. And um, a lot of it was just overcomplicating the process. Mm. Me working in tech is just like me working in finance or me working at a church or me working at a, at a hospital or whatever. It's a job. And just and similar to what David was saying, um, you being able to speak to um, those transferable skills and be able to walk walk in your purpose and walk in your truth and walk in your power into these opportunities that is going to ha that's going to enable you to get into that door. And also, I really think that we are held back by imposter syndrome. Right? Mm -hmm. um, we we have this we have this grand idea of what tech is and. Tech is just a simple industry, similar to investment banking, similar to um, hospitality or any other kind of industry. And yes, tech is hot right now, but um, we need we need to also realize that tech is just enough, as a whole other industry. And if we need and if we need, and if we start to break tech down and start overcomplicating it and to um, and to walk into our power and to walk in our truth, I think that we as a people. Um, we can make significant inroads in the industry. Awesome, awesome. Well said. I'm going to get to that imposter, um, imposter syndrome piece. But, Daryl, you have some skin in the game. I'm definitely interested in wondering why you why you feel or why you think that people think that this industry is intimidating. Yeah, well, first of all, it should not be, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a walking example of somebody that doesn't have um, a career in technology. I started off at, you know, at Disney, and you know, I've worked at Nike. I've been I've been across a different a few different categories, and I think we've all said it. That is, what your skill set is should dictate what it is you want to do, not the industry. So tech is an industry. Now, if you want to be a code, you, if you want to code, or if you want to be a an RF engineer, or you want to have a technical skill set that is applicable to the industry, that's a different story, right? And then, then then you do need to come with a set of skills. That are applicable to to the space but for many of us as as we already alluded to you know the tech industry has finance the tech industry has marketing the tech industry has hr the tech industry has sales the tech industry has every one of the other um functional expertise that any big business needs to have in order to thrive right um so that's the first thing i would say is just understand what your transferable skill set is and then all of a sudden, this concept of tech starts to lose its 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 
it's magic, right? Um, there is a learning curve to understand the value proposition that tech means in, you know, in society, right? What what value is it bringing when you think about it from even from your perspective as a user, right? You know, whether it's a smartphone, a computer, or 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 using the cloud, and you know what they call edge computing and things like that. Yeah. You're going to have to understand that, but just like you would anything else, the finance in industry has several devices that you can invest in, right? Um, you need to understand them before you can sell them. You can you need to understand them before you market them. Um, so I would look at the industry not so much as this intimidating, um, this this enigmatic thing. It's just what what off what 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 do I have to offer? What what skill set do I have to bring to the table? Um, and how do I insert myself into that narrative? Yeah. Daryl, have you ever felt um, or kind of dealt with imposter syndrome? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, one being someone who is not, um, you know, we're, we're not in great number when we, you know, as, a, as, as any organization starts to narrow off, uh, there are fewer and farther of us between, right? Yeah. Um, so there's always that question that you ask yourself, am I, do I deserve to be here? Yeah. Um, but I quickly worked my way through those challenging questions by just basically saying to myself, I have my authentic voice. I have, you know, I've put in the time. I have the credentials. I have the resume. I have the results, right? So I'm not going to question um, whether or not I deserve to be here. Now, if there are things I still need to learn, that's great. I, I'll embrace that journey uh, as anyone else should. But I'm never going to challenge my my own existence in in my space because you know I've done the work to get here, and 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 that'll happen. And you have to re reinforce that with we have to reinforce that with ourselves mm -hmm. because society has always told us right that you're here because right. Somebody had to do something in order for you to get the break. You didn't do it yourself. Yeah. All of those types of things. So that's been ingrained. Yeah. And we have to constantly work our way through those types of self, that, that, that self-talk in order for us to really realize the fact that, yes, no, I am wearing, that, I, I am wearing the crown. Yeah. And I have, I've, I've justly deserved to wear the crown. Mm -hmm. And that's with every walk, whatever, whatever capacity we're serving in. Oh, true, true. Yeah, I've, you know, I've worked in the legal industry uh, before venturing out to do, I guess, you know, tech and being in this space right now, creating quintessential gentlemen and all the accolades and I do great. And, I, you know, I've increased our rankings when I've done dig uh, digital marketing, all of those type of stuff and still wake up every day going into the office like, yeah, I don't I'm, I'm here, but I'm nervous. Did I do this right? Should I be here? And all of those type of things. So it's, it's definitely a challenge and an ongoing challenge. Um, Daniel, I want to know, how do you overcome um, imposter syndrome? Oh, my gosh. So <laughs> coming into my new role, I had major imposter syndrome. Um, and I, I'm a man of faith. And so when I was going through my process and really contemplating leaving financial services, um, I'm like, God, why me? Why are you choosing me for this? And you know, your goals have to scare you. And so I was really scared coming into coming into tech and coming into the industry. And as soon as I came in, I'm like, okay, I'm too busy to be scared. So we <laughs> well, we don't jump in feet first at this point. But right. Right. the beautiful thing about using these transferable skills that we've talked about, HR is HR regardless of where you are. There's just there's just some nuance. There's, 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 some, there's just some, some industry nuance that you're going to have to learn and it's going to take time to ramp up to. But in my role, critical thinking, being an empathetic leader, um, knowing um, employment law, knowing policy, um, being, uh, being able to finesse policy uh, while being pragmatic, um, having a strong relationship management skills. So all these different things are very important um, in my role, but these are also transferable. So as I was able to grow into my role, I was able to have have, this, have my imposter syndrome subside because I was able to walk in my purpose and walk in the truth that God had, had already destined for me to walk into. And so that was the beautiful thing about the imposter syndrome. It never existed because it was never there. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well said. Well said. David, any thoughts on imposter yeah. syndrome or how we can not let it cripple us? Yeah. So... 
Eric, you just mentioned that you had a career in legal and then you moved over to doing media and social media and things like that. And so, you know, a lot of times, many of us in our culture share that type of uh, background and where often we doubt ourselves, the truth be told, that really makes you an anomaly. What other lawyer is running a podcast, social media, magazine, power list, et cetera, right? Um, you would be hard pressed to go find one that has your exact past experiences that brings to bear to this specific career path. And so that makes you an anomaly, right? Malcolm Gladwell wrote books about outliers. That makes you an anomaly and really gives you an advantage that others don't have. You just have to have the clarity to see that advantage that, oh, I have, I know the legal side and maybe there's something I can do to make this particular business venture more successful than others, right? That becomes a competitive advantage for you. We all have that. We just have to be courageous enough to be able to share it. I think about like, um, you talk about imposter syndrome, um, you know, people with smaller visions, a smaller vision than you cannot measure your greatness, right? You know, um, you're, you're on a different type of trajectory and they're trying to measure you in this linear way and you're moving exponential. Um, and, and they may project their own insecurities or limitations on you, right? But, you know, you go watch any, any superhero movie, Iron Man, Wonder Woman, Black Panther, you pick it. Um, you know, they don't know what to do when, the, when, you know, when everything falls apart. They're standing there kind of imposter syndrome, like, I don't know, do we do this? Do we do that? How do we? And at some point, they just realize that the hero is inside of them and they just got to get moving, right? I think that we all have that. We just have to put our faith to work and get moving. And so, you know, with imposter syndrome, it's real. It happens. It limitates. It limits you. It, it, it creates mental um, uh, challenges for us all. But uh, we have to be able to see beyond that. And it's not just about us, right? A lot of times it's about we need to go make this move so that we can help the pipeline, right? So we can help the next generation of we need to be courageous enough to go stand up to whoever's opposing us or maybe doubting us or, or step up to whatever challenges in front of us because others are watching, right? Others are watching Daryl to see if Daryl's going to go drive that new phone or that new service and, and if he's willing to go take it to the next degree and get exponential results, then they're like, yeah, man, if Daryl can do it, I can too. Right. Because it's a little hard for them to think Granville T Woods versus, you know, average person today. No, so true, so true. You know, you gonna you made my uh might made my mom a little happy by um giving me a law degree. I was in marketing and legal, not a lawyer. Don't get her calling me saying what happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's still legal. You still work in this space. Hey, listen, <laughs> ask those lawyers how important their marketing budget is. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um. But David, I'm going to come back to you and I want to talk about these myths um, inside of the tech industry. Tell me a little bit about a couple of myths that, you know, you think, you know, people just nah, that's that's not really how this works. Um, you know, I think one myth is that you have to have a certain background in order to enter tech. I'll tell you right now. Um, last year, I hired maybe a couple dozen folks. A lot of black women, black men, Hispanic men and women, um, Asian LGBTQ, um, people living with disabilities, um, promotions. You know, a lot of these folks were promoted um, into an autom into my uh, automation organization. Mm -hmm. Everyone didn't come with a traditional STEM and tech background, mm -hmm. right? But they had, every last one of them did have a measure of grit, a measure of resolve, because on my team, the things that we're after, we're going to go do what hasn't been done before. We're going to do the impossible. There are a lot of people, internal and external, that will say that what we're about to go do cannot be done. But over and over and over, we've done it. We delivered the first visual IVR for telecommunications. We've saved, you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions in contra revenue efforts. Uh, we have the largest bot program worldwide. You know, sometimes folks start to doubt themselves, but the numbers don't lie. 
finance checks my math regularly. And so I think one of the big myths is that you have to come from these specific um, universities or specific technology tracks. And those things help. Don't get me wrong. You know, technology can be a very complex um, discipline. And there's a certain level of, of aptitude and, you know, that you have to apply to that. But just because you didn't go to Georgia Tech or just because you don't have a degree in machine learning or maybe your degree is from, you know, a, a decade or so ago, doesn't mean that you don't qualify. Yeah. Put the pedal to the metal. Let's go. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Daniel, tell us what a uh, uh, myth that you think about the industry. Now, Eric, I'm going to choose violence with this one. OK. OK. All right. Every job in tech is not a six figure job. I feel that all over social media, no matter what platform you're going to be on, you're going to see people talk about um, how much they have jumped from role to role to role and how much they're making all this money and they are six figures okay. and all this stuff. And that may or may not be true. Okay. It depends on the role and it depends on the market value of the role. Mm -hmm. And so when looking at tech, as you would with any role, do your research on what the compensation would look like um, and, and understand um, the, the, um, the market, for not only for the role, but also the location that you're in as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, the beautiful thing about tech is that um, tech um, has very desirable compensation packages that entice people that can help generate uh, that can help um, create generational wealth from years to come with with equity and bonuses and other types of variable compensation, right? But um, there is a huge misnomer, and I see it all every single day on blogs, on social media, and you know whatever that. Um, that role, every single role in tech is, is six figures. And that's not, not that not, that is not necessarily true. What about remote? Is remote one of them? Is, is remote is definitely guarantee every tech you could go remote? Cause that's no. not every company is very different. It depends on, it depends on the company. Right. And so you need to find what works best for you. I'm uh, not everybody wants to be remote. Some people want to be hybrid. Some people want to be fully in the office. Some people want to build office culture. Some people are totally fine with being remote. You just have to do what's best for you. I know that Black people um, statistically have said they prefer working from, working from home and they want re remote jobs. Totally understand. I get that. But if you're in the market looking to pivot into tech, do your research and look at the companies that are piquing your interest in, and, and um, attract what you want um, holistically in a role. Right on, right on. Daryl. Well, I, I have to just plus one to what, uh, what David and Daniel have already said. Um, I don't, can't really add much more to that other than the fact that not every, like I mentioned earlier, not every role in tech is a tech role. Yeah. Right. There's there are a number of different opportunities to pursue um, in the in the industry. Let's start there. Um, the other thing is there are certain roles that are more coveted um, and as a result come with, uh, you know, a higher degree of scrutiny and a higher level of expectation in terms of the contribution from from folks that are coming in. Yes. But that's also not no different than any other uh, industry or any other um, environment. And the last thing I'd say is, um, you know, given everything that we have had to navigate these last two years, the idea, especially if you're if you're this is a this is what I call an employee. An employee's market mm -hmm. right now. Right. Um, there is a there is a, a, a need for, you know, diversity of thought. There is a need for expertise across a number of different disciplines. Um, and there's this recognition from from re, from from big big companies that I can't just anchor you to you know major metropolitans anymore, right? Um, I'm going to have to be more more malleable when it comes to where I ask you to work and that kind of thing, so that I can maintain some competition uh, or maintain competitive um, you know my, my competitive place in my industry. 
So, you know, the, the some of the myths that are out there probably are some that that predate what happened with COVID and everything else. And that is, you know, you got to be in Silicon Valley, right? You, you got to be in, you know, a major metro in order for you to make the contributions in this industry that are required of us. That's not the case anymore, right? Um, and most of us, I think David's in Dallas, um, uh, Daniel's in New York, I'm in the Bay Area. Um, I have offices in Colorado, I have offices in Portland, I have offices pretty much everywhere in the country, dare I say everywhere in the world. So, you know, if, 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 if some of those initial filters that you would use that might preclude you from wanting to pursue a role, uh, knock those down and ask yourself the question, is, do I like what the company stands for? Do I like what the environment stands for? And then start to write your script and, and use that script to help inform whether or not um, there's a match between you and said organization. Awesome, awesome. Well said, well said. Um, so, David, I'm coming, coming back to you. And I want to know, um, in your opinion, how can we, you know, close this this racial gap, um, as well as like any other barriers to entry in this industry? Because, you know, the, the numbers are what the numbers are. You know, we don't have a high percentage um, in in the industry um, in terms of companies and things like that. And not to put any companies out there, but you you can Google and find out what those numbers are and the percentages are. But you know how 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 do we change that yeah so um there's a few schools of thought to that right um there's how well we work with other ethnicities that may have a dominant role in technology and can we break through those um ranks and and, and get some positioning there um i like to start at home though and so i would say look i think that a key to success for a group of people is not complicated. It is about aligning and coming together. And if you can do that, go and look at any ethnicity that you want um, over history. Um, it wasn't because they were the smartest or the hardest working or the most technology or the, they aligned on one, whatever it was, and they came together and they didn't stop until they got it. And I think for us as a culture, we have to do that. We have to, um, gone are the days of kiss the ring or i'm going to promote you to a level under me but never over me i'll never recommend you to be on my level or higher gone are those days because it never will grow the circle right um if i hook up all my homeboys with jobs okay that's the same circle that did nothing for the culture right i mean that's just one body of that's one isolated group of people versus um for me to go the distance for someone who is not a part of my circle, whether I'm proactively reaching out to them or they're reaching out to me because they see the title or the, 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 the name or the office and they want some help, being open to those types of things because often in our culture, we do this weird thing where you gotta be so good that you're better than everybody else, but not better than me. Man, who can fly in that rare, thin slice of air for people to fly in? And I think, First and foremost, we got to take it on ourselves to make sure that the glass ceiling is intended. Mm. Oof. That's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. Um, Daryl, we'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I use a safe statement all the time. Somebody, you know, might be, you know, just uh, in passing say something. I'm trying to be like you, B. I'm trying to be like you, my dog. And I'm like, nope, aim higher. <laughs> yep. Aim higher, right? Um, so I, I'm in the same vein, right? Is this idea that um, one, well, let's, let's look at it this way, right? Um, a company and an employee, uh, specifically with us, is a two way responsibility, right? We have to be as attractive to it as it is to us, right? And part of it is I only want to be in places where somebody sees me like I see them. <laughs> I don't want to be. I don't. I don't want to be the one that's. You know, I, I. I can't. I can't assimilate to the culture. I'm always on an island. I'm never at the table. I'm never in the room. That's not an inviting experience for me if I'm trying to build my career. So it's a again it's a reciprocating responsibility that sits between you know an organization and Daniel. You probably have to deal with this probably more than than either one of us does. 
is we have to be as an, as an organization, as an entity in, in Google's case, we have to be just as attractive to, to the populace that we want to, that we want to reflect going back to that mirror concept um, as, as the individual has to be to us, right. Coming with the, with the, the resume and all those types of things that come with it. That's, that's, that's first and foremost. The second thing is, um, are we casting our net wide enough? Right. You know, the, the traditional practices of hiring, you know, in some cases they do follow a certain protocol, but in a lot of cases, you know, give my man a look, this is my dude, you know, um, put him on. Right. And that happens quite a bit. Right. And that's one of the reasons why we're not as represented, because there are so few of us already. So we have an exponentially difficult job in some regards because we have to make sure that that net gets extended. Right. I actively ensure that HBCUs, for example, are part of our um, um, marketing intern program that wasn't necessarily required before, but it now is. And I, you know, like I said, I've only been in the seat a, a few months, but I've said it's imperative that we make sure that, again, if we're going to be representative of the cultures and the, and the environments that we serve, that we're going out and we're finding the talent that, that is representative of that. And that means casting that net. So it goes back to, again, let's make sure that the, the businesses and the brands are as attractive to the individuals as the individuals are to the brands. And let's make sure that we're casting the widest net possible to ensure we have opportunities to understand where that talent is and those that are that are seeking those opportunities know where to go to to pursue them. Exactly. Exactly. Daniel, let you know, I had to had to save you for last. <laughs> um hundred percent agree with everything that um that Daryl and, and, and David said. I want to maybe take it to a very tactical level um, of what people can tangibly do to to get their foot in the door and to um, uh, to enter into the industry. And so, first and foremost, shoot your shot. Um, yeah. you, know, you you absolutely have to shoot your shot. And when you shoot your shot, f really focus on the transferable skills that you have and ensure that you have you know, somewhat of the credentials to for the role and for the opportunity, right? And so um, there absolutely cannot be a, mis a, a misalignment of roles and, and expectations. But if you are, if you have a, some transferable skills, wholeheartedly, you most de definitely should apply. You most definitely should reach out to people on LinkedIn. Um, you most definitely should reach out to people in your network, go to networking events, be a part of diverse organizations that are that specialize in getting um, black and brown people into tech. Whole, 100 percent. You most definitely should do that. But also, if you are to do that, make sure that your stuff is tight. So make sure that your resume is together. Make sure that your pitch is together, your, your, um, your elevator pitch is together. Make sure that your LinkedIn is up to date and on point. If you message somebody on LinkedIn, make sure that it's, it's very clear and concise and, and has everything um, in the body of the, of, of the message that is pertinent to that individual. Make sure that you've done a little bit of research, research in the company. Um, you shouldn't necessarily be reaching out to someone as senior as Daryl and asking, "Hey, Daryl, I want to, uh, I want to go to YouTube. What are some roles that? What are some roles you should, you as an individual should be already be looking into um, the roles at YouTube and and already look at the alignment that you already see. Now, you, now you may ask Daryl for a recommendation or what are, what are your thoughts, but you should already do that initial step in that regard. Yeah. But also conversely, from a from a company perspective." One thing that I think, and I think this is, this is industry agnostic, people need, hiring managers and corporations need to um, really broaden their perspective of the role, of the requirements of, of respective roles. Mm -hmm. uh, people have very um, distinct ideas of what they want in a candidate and what they want in a role, um, and that may not be it. Um, and and people need to really understand the value of on the job training, the value of mentorship, the value of using your resources as a man, as a hiring manager or as a team lead or whomever, HR or whatever, to really help guide those individuals and in taking a chance, taking a chance on, on a diamond in the rough. So if you if 
for example, if you have, um, you know, programmatic experience, for example, but you don't have agency experience, mm -hmm. you can teach these people some of these skills, for example, but you as you as a as a as a manager, it's, it's very it's, it's incumbent upon you to really help expand your thinking so that you can add that that diversity on your team. So it's very important that corporations um, open their minds um, so that people um, can, 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 can get in the industry and, and join these roles as well. Okay. No, that's can I sure please, 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 please. behind Daniel on that. So I, I fully agree. And the points that he was bringing up about getting your LinkedIn together, your resume, your interview, all of those things help to shape a story, right? I think in technology, um, it's easy to get caught up in the zeros and ones, right? The JSON and C sharp and all that other stuff. But without a story, folks have a hard time understanding what that technology or what that skill you have is. What do you bring to bear? And so I think it's really important to build a story around whatever it is you're trying to go accomplish. In, in the role that I'm in today, my team is working, you know, we're building things in technology, but at the same time, we're crafting stories so that people can understand and have some appreciation for what it is that we're building or how to use it and why it is good. And, and whether that's a, a, a bot that we're building, a, a machine learning algorithm, or a candidate, it's still the same um, recipe that goes with it. You need a story and you have to shape that story so that people can have some appreciation for the talent that you bring or whoever um, to whatever job you're looking for. That's great. Great. Agreed. Um, so um, I'm going to stay with you, David, but I want to kind of piggyback off of what Daniel said as it pertains to networking. Uh, I don't think we have enough conversations around networking. One, I think networking is trans. All, all industries, you should be networking and trying to find jobs and things like that. But I'm interested to know just your thoughts on networking, um, specifically in the tech space, either your thoughts on the benefits of networking and how to network. Um, I would say probably post-COVID or where we can actually be out and there's more events and things like that. But, you know, you can take yeah. it from there. So, you know, um, there's a lot of levels to it. I'll try to hit a few, but, you know, when I think about that, you know, in a COVID world where, you know, we're virtual most of the time, um, you can still network and your LinkedIn, your digital persona, your the brand image that you're uh, portraying uh, will help to facilitate a lot of that, right? Um, what are you putting out? If, do people think of you as a thought leader? What are you thinking about? Is it related to technology? Is it something others can benefit from? Um, are you joining in in the social conversation on technology? Uh, those things help when it comes to virtual networking. But, you know, just keeping it real, Daryl and I just met today. We had a conversation before this started and he and I are going to connect. Yeah. OK. He's being his authentic self and I am as well. There are things that we're both having conversations about and we're thinking, man, there might be something advantageous that we can put chocolate and peanut butter together. We're rich. And so I think a lot of times you have to think of it that way. Maybe do a little bit of research about where you're going and who are the people in the space you're going to be networking with. And then know what it is that you do. Have your story, your elevator pitch, right? Have that together so that when you meet these people in a very non-intrusive, not taking up their whole evening, light way, you can explain to them how you bring value in some kind of way that you have some type of understanding about what they do. And that creates a real safe space to have a decent conversation. You leave it, you get their information, you connect with them another day, you're off to the races. You keep doing that over and over, I promise your network will grow overnight. Great, agreed. Daryl, thoughts on networking? Well, I think there's a you know, there's some fallacy in the concept. And that is, you know, networking equates to, let me just accumulate a bunch of names and a, a bunch of business cards. And, you know, that's, that's my network. Um, if you don't have a purpose for connecting with somebody, don't connect with them, right? There's, there's no value in just adding another notch and another number to your accumulated followers and all those all that stuff type of stuff right um there's a place for that but that's not in the network 
sphere, right? So network with a purpose, right? Do you want, you know, technical expertise? Do you want somebody to help you with um, professional guidance? Do you want someone to, to, to help you with, with your narrative? I think um, David just talked about helping you write your narrative. Do you want somebody to help you find your voice? Do you want somebody to help you find your passions? What is the network it is that you're trying to create and for what purpose, right? And more importantly, it's quid pro quo. You know, a lot of, a lot of young people, I talk to quite a few of them, there, there's, an, there's a what's in it for me only type of mentality. And the fact of the matter is that the, the value has to be twofold. I sit in a role where I want to derive value by being able to say, I put this young cat on, I put this, this young person on because I really believe in them, right? That's where, that's, that's, the, that's, that, that's the reward I get. But if all you want is access to me or access to, to, a, to a seat like mine for, for your own game without ever doing anything in return, okay, what, how, how does this work both ways, right? That's what a network actually has, has a, a, a duplicity to it, you know, that actually works both ways, okay. um, not just one way. So, like I said, if, if you're going to network, make sure you build your network with purpose and then make sure that you're bringing value to, to, to the exchange that you're having with whomever it is. Uh, you're right. You hit it right on the head. One thing, one thing I've been focusing on this year um, is intention. Being intentional about the conversations, being intentional about the networking, being intentional about whatever type of relationships you're trying to build. So to add to your point, it's, it's the intention is there for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, what's your thoughts on um, networking? I know you spoke a little bit about it. If you want to add some more to it. Oh, yeah. Um, what I want to add to it is just the very basics. Yeah. Um, treat people with respect and treat people how you want to be treated because you never know when you may need somebody. You may never know when you might cross somebody's path again very quick story um i got my job my current job um from a recruiter that i worked with for a, uh, for a job that i did not get five years ago right. but we stayed in touch uh and the t again this is a financial services totally different industry but we stayed in touch um and i was very kind i mean he was very kind and we were able to form a connection and, and keep in touch over, over time you never never know especially in tech and Daryl and David can, can, can attest to this. The industry is very small. And especially being black men, we're going to stick out just given kind of where we are right now. And so it's very important that when you network, that you're empathetic, that you're kind, that um, you're treating people well, that you're not mean, you're not curt. Um, so all those very small details can yield dividends um, as you progress your career um, and as you navigate the networking world. Perfect, perfect. Well said. And my last question for everyone, and we'll start with um, we'll start with Daniel, is what advice do you have for, you know, we gave him a whole bunch of gems, but if you had to leave everybody with one thing um, as it pertains to entering in this industry, if they're in the industry looking to grow, you know, what advice would you give to them? Go ahead, Daniel. Um, I'm going to give you some very uh, pie in the sky, very high level, um, 10,000 feet in the air advice. Um, what One thing I would tell you to grow in the industry and grow into your career, um, and this is regardless if you're in tech or, or not, do an international assignment. Prior to me coming into uh, to tech, um, I was able to work abroad for six months in, in Singapore. So living abroad in Asia um, and having to have that experience truly changed my life. It not only changed my life and changed how I view the world, it also changed my career trajectory in ways that I had never even imagined. I did not, the, 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 the rooms that I was able to get in after I had a Singapore on my resume, I would have never gotten had if I did not have that experience. So regardless of what industry that you, that you are in, um, you know, as you continue to grow into your career, you become a senior, look out for those opportunities to, to, to go abroad. Look out, look out for those opportunities to, to take on additional assignments, stretch assignments or um, other inter, uh, internal mobility uh, opportunities so that you can grow and diversify your skill set and, and to also grow your mind as well. 
Yes, you all have to see what else is out there. There's other places outside than the 50, uh, 50 states. So definitely agree with that one. Um, David, your advice? Yeah. Um, look, I think that if you can, a lot of what we're talking about in technology, um, a lot of times it's just the next logical step, right? There was a huge patent battle Apple and Samsung had several billions of dollars. It was only about the swipe across the phone, right? Next logical step. So don't overcomplicate it and think about it as about as in the, the vein of problem solving. Proactively go find something broken and fix it. Don't wait on someone to tell you what to do. Don't wait on the interview. Don't wait on any of that. Right now, proactively go find something broken or not optimized and fix it. If you can do that, you have vision. If you can work through it, you have foresight. If you can uh, partner with people that's in a personal skills, hopefully you're documenting it. That's your results. That, that's most, if not everything that folks are looking for in an extraordinary, le leader, extraordinary leadership model. So proactively go find something broken and fix it. Start small. You don't want everybody to see your mistakes. Everybody makes them. But once you do that, you build some momentum and you'll be off to the races. Awesome. Great advice. Great advice. And Daryl. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll park it in, in four quadrants, which are the, the way that I've pretty much managed my career. Um, passion, talent, skill, experience. You always have to explore what you're passionate about. Where you do have talents, you need to cultivate them, right? For whatever skills you do have, you need to continue to sharpen them. And then throughout your, your journey, always catalog your experiences. At any point in time, if you're taking inventory across those four things, you'll decide what's most important to me at different points in my career, right? Do I really want to explore my passions right now? Do I really want to sharpen my skills right now around a specific area? Um, is there something I'm really talented about that I want to, I want to, you know, um, put forward and use that inventory on a regular basis because your, your passions and your talents are going to change. Your skill set's going to increase. Your wealth of experience should, should grow. Right. And ev at every moment, you should be able to go back and look at that inventory and ask yourself, okay, am I qualified for whatever it is that I have an aspiration for? Between that and what I said way early on about, you know, taking two steps and thinking one, um, I think you'll, you'll find that it's a great navigational tool. It won't answer every question um, and it won't solve every problem. It's not a panacea, but it's one of the ways that I've been able to keep myself on track and asking myself at different points in time in my career, what things were most important. And I would I'm, I'm, was always prepared to dial up and dial down uh, different things at different points in time. So passion, talent, skill, experience. Wow, that's perfect, perfect. Thank you. So one thing I did just realize is that I'm the only one who has an E um, to start my name with David Daryl Daniel. <laughs> Clearly, I'm the anomaly, um, but I want to say thank you all for um, really just dropping these gems for us, having this conversation, and allowing us to, you know, pick your brains for free. Um, it's really important for us to continue to have these conversations and to continue to, you know, help the next generation and, you know, to further learn from the generation here. So, again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our 2022 Power List inside of our Power Issue. Guys, make sure you get that magazine if you have not got that so you can learn more from these gentlemen right here. And to the audience, thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure y'all look for more things coming up from the Point of Central Gentlemen. We're building this community and we need y'all to be a part of it. We look forward to talking to you. Everybody, thank you so much. Have a great night.